Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for our Not Your Normal Sunday show. I'm Jeffrey Darty, the Christian whistleblower. And as always, on Sunday with your coffee, I'm joined by R. Wayne Steiger out in Chile, Colorado. And it's 72 degrees here in Clearwater Beach. So <laughs> a, 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 a bit of opposites here. It's opposite world. Uh, and you know. we're glad to be here, Wayne. How are you on what is for you a chilly morning? I do well. And how are you, my friend? You know what? It's, I, if I said this the other day, and it, it seems to be silly, but it's true. If I've been better, I can't remember when. What was that famous line in Wall Street? Um, Greed is good. <laughs> Charlie Sheen, as he walks in, and they say, well, how are you, bud? And he said, um, if I were any more innocent, I'd be guilty. Right, or if I was any better, I'd be twins. Something like that. Yeah. So good movie. We got by Daytona the way. Beach here. We got Osaka, Japan here. Good morning. Morning. We got Calgary, Alberta. We got Thank South you. Africa. We got Glasgow, Scotland. Thank you. Thank you for coming by. Uh, Philip needs a job. He works for free. Not sure where he is. India as India. well. India. Wow. Excellent. You know, that's the thing about it. You know, the anyway it's just it's just it really inspires me to know that i mean we've been on a minute and 26 seconds and we're already literally reaching across the world in Texas, in tampa i hope that you're coming over to the what to do when you're dead seminar well, on the 10th say, good morning good afternoon good evening and um thank you <laughs> phillips at the airport Wow. Well, good flight. Good flight, my friend. Um, Don't fly here today, Philip, because I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember those days as a uh, road warrior. I mean, so does my wife, getting up at three o'clock in the morning on Sundays and heading to the airport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't like that. You'd rather just stay home, huh? I really would. Um, today, it's... Uh, to go into travel today, it's such a mind coitus just to get through the mazes that we set up for ourselves. And it's not that security ever does anything. I mean, the TSA here is, and sadly, how most security systems are reactionary instead of being proactive. And, you know, here we are literally a decade later from the shoe bomber who tried to get onto a flight. We have technology now that when you go through those scanners that could easily detect anything of a um, explosive nature. And it's just crazy. I don't like it. I don't like it here in the United States because, you know, I have a, a TSA pre, so I don't have to go through the, uh, it's the roll of the dice of whether you're gonna be groped or not. You know, and I think it's just ridiculous so anyway. And I think I just, I was looking this up because I don't like to quote statistics that aren't accurate, but um, in so, so-called red teams of Homeland Security agents posing as passengers were able to get weapons past TSA agents in 67 out of 70 tests, a 95% failure rate, according to TSA agency officials. Mm -hmm. The amount of theft that takes place with TSA agents. And I mean, they say, well, these are just random events. Well, apparently in Philadelphia, that random event involved like a group of <laughs> people, uh, not only TSA agents, but ramp agents. And uh, they had a great scam going on. And, oh, stealing things out of people's luggage? Yeah, yeah. And well, you know, it goes back to the old saying on meet the parents, always just have a carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I love Do De Niro. your best to just have a carry on. I love De Niro. And now even that is becoming more and more of an issue. Hey, listen, anyone that does any frequent flyer knows I used to Now I got to, I was always in the first class. So I got to be at the front of the line, but even at the front of the line, there's a front of the line. And, you know, it's that overhead bin space in which everyone knows is like precious real estate. Anyway, 
and you fight for it. You really do. Can't put it's, that it's, in. It's, a, it's a crazy world travel. Of course, we're coming up on Thanksgiving, and they say it's going to be the most traveled Thanksgiving in history. Yeah. I mean, we got the, the Trump economy humming along. The Dow's never been higher, and unemployment hasn't been lower in the past 20 years. So I guess people are feeling the flow, and they're saying, hey, let's go ahead and get out there and do some traveling. So if you are traveling next week, please be safe. Uh, please give yourself some extra time. And, you know, it, it, take a little bit of extra time to make sure that you get there in one piece and get back in one piece. And after the Thanksgiving week, I'll be going up to the Georgia Guidestones, so we should have an, an interesting show from there. Excellent, excellent. I just want to say one thing on the economy. So what a lot of people are – they, they that's, they're, have this cognitive dissonance. They're seeing the stock market go absolutely crazy. In fact, folks, when you add nearly $5 trillion of wealth, um, that's unprecedented. But here's the thing. We won't see these effects for until next year. And because there's always a delay in the actual economy that we feel here at what I would call the public level. It's going to work its well through, and there is a tsunami coming in, but at the same time, I just need to let everyone know, there's also a lot of warning signs that says that there is a huge correction coming, um, and just be prepared for it. Uh, some speculate it could be a 30 to 40% correction, but take it in perspective. Take it from where we were when Trump entered in, which we were at a Dow 18,000, I think. Today, we're at a Dow 23,000. So even if we had a correction, which has been prognosticated for a long time anyway, uh, remember, there is still a great deal of wealth. And what you'll hear is how much wealth was lost overnight. They'll never tell you that most of these people have taken their profits and pushed them off to the side. So I don't know why I've said that. Someone needed to hear it. Now, Wayne, what is, uh, what is Trump talking about when he talks about these trillions of dollars that are offshore that can't come back into the country and he's changing things so that people will bring yeah. them back in? So during the Obama administration, the, the, the Dodd-Frank, uh, the 2010 Wall Street Reform Act, no one read that. I did. I read all freaking 2,800 pages of it. it was the single largest takeover of, in, in world history of a government of the private economy. That's what the Obama administration did in 2010. And everyone's just, oh, we just love this guy. And I'm going, really? Hmm. Really? Has anyone read the law? No. Do you know why that neither Christopher Dodd or Barney Frank are in Congress? They're the yahoos that offered this thing, and we got this thing. In fact, he just stepped down. He resigned on Friday, Richard Cadre of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And, you know, folks, the, the way that this thing was set up was illegal. It was, it was non-democratic across the board. And so what happened was Obama began to make it so restrictive on corporations here in the U.S. that the policy alone was designed to push companies into the international market, to get them out of the U.S. economy directly, and to put them over under the preview of foreign governments. That's what there was, and that's what it did. And now we have trillions of dollars that the corporations would love to bring back in and, and what the average American and consumer doesn't understand is this. They say, well, what's the big deal? Oh, it's a huge big deal, folks. Because when you've got nearly, I, I think in some cases, they estimated $12, $15 trillion potentially sitting offshore that could be coming back into the U.S. economy, it's just incredible. I mean, you're talking rebuilding of plants. Um, we've got the robotic takeover right now. And we have got to get something balanced here in the United States to bring manufacturing back into this uh, equation. So that's what Trump is looking to do. I think Munchen will do it. Uh, he's a smart guy. Listen, I often said this. I would rather have a billionaire 
running the U.S. finances than a guy who's trying to make a million. Absolutely. Brittany, I don't understand your question. There's a question in the chat room. And good morning, Heidi Vandenberg, morning, a Heidi. young oracle, a great Vedic life coach. She will be one of the featured speakers at the December 10th, What to Do When You're Dead, Extravaganza of Enlightenment in Clearwater, Florida. Brittany says, might you have an opinion on what happened the other night? I was learning about the Anunnaki. I've asked the universe how the Old Testament God could be a benevolent God. I'm not sure what you're talking about, what happened the other night, Brittany, but all you have to do is actually read the Old Testament, and you will see beyond a shadow of a doubt that that God, whomever he is, was far from a benevolent God. I got to tell you what, and I know we did, you know, I love what, you know, I love this energy that we have here, Jeff, because there is really a flow that really is tangible. We didn't even talk about this before we came on, but Brittany, to answer your question from me, I don't, I don't understand what happened the other night, but, um, you know, Jeff, I've I'll been tell you what, I guarantee you there wasn't much happened around here the other night because not much ever happens <laughs> around here. Now, Friday night over on my channel, we had just an absolutely fantastic show with Heidi and Jeff. And Speaking of Heidi Vandenberg, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, by the way, the total viewership while we were on for that two hours uh, hit 640. So 640 people were viewing that program live. Um, really want to talk Excellent. about this book here. Uh, excuse me, everyone. Listen, folks, if you know, all of you are struggling um, with trying to get the rationale here about the Old Testament, let me just tell you something about the Bible. This is Wayne Steiger's opinion. It's not Jeff's. The, the Bible is nothing more than a Hebraic spell. And when you dive into it, you're diving into that spell. Now, I know you don't want to hear this. I know people fight it. But here's the deal, folks. A hundred years ago, the world did not know of the Samaritan culture. Never heard of them. Didn't know anything about them. In the last 156 years, archaeologists have dug up over 100,000 tablets, fragments, cylinders of the Samaritan people. The Samaritan are the very first written record of human beings. Nothing existed before them. Your Hebrew God is a fantasy. It's a made-up God. I'm going to tell you why. Because if you now have to take the history of these people and what they did, their, their nation, their country, was before, between the Tigris and the Euphrates in lower Iraq, right there in northern part of Iran, where your Bible talks about your Garden of Eden. These people were living there. And the thing about it, Jeff, is this. We know now everything about 21st human society culturals have not changed in nearly 6,000 years. No progress, folks. Zero. Zero. Hear me out on this. This book is about, uh, it's by Professor uh, Samuel Noah Kramer. Uh, he has a great, I've, I've studied two of his textbooks already. He is probably the world's most renowned Sumologist. Well, yes, that is an actual discipline of science. The Sumologists are those who are so well versed now in the cuneiform that they have now translated virtually all of the tablets and they're finding more. Here's the problem, folks. This is where your Bible came from. This is where your God from the Bible came from. Your Jesus is nothing more than a reincarnation of an ancient Samaritan deity. Hate to break it to you, folks, because that's the reality of what we're learning. And because if these people, in fact, lived, and we know they did, I, I've, I can tell you what their schools were like. Um, to go to school in Sumer, we're talking about 4,000 BC. Number one, you had to be wealthy. Girls were not allowed in school. Girls were allowed no property. Females were allowed no property. 
and only the rich could send their children, their, their sons to school. Now, school was not anything fun. Uh, beginning at typically the age of five until the age of sometimes 30, um, you would learn how to write into the tablets. Wayne Rebecca asks, if that's true, and if the Bible is a spell, then why didn't it work on her when she was a child? And Wayne, I thought it was smoking ain't allowed in school. <laughs> um, Rebecca, listen, there is a lot of mysteries that we're finding out. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that reading this book, and this is the tablets. This is not made up history. The, you know, listen, the problem that we have with the Bible is that no one has the original books. No one. Here we got the original tablets. These people were litigious. Their society was the same. They had gangs. Can you believe this? Their teenagers had gangs. It was a problem. Um, they had a Congress. They had an upper house and a lower house. Now, the king ruled, but the king would have to, in many cases, go in civil affairs to the Congress. Now, the Congress was particularly healthy for the king when he wanted to uh, call war because the upper house was called the house of elders. The lower house was called, and get this, the armed men of the citizens of the public. <laughs> and it was basically what it was. And when you study real history, that's what I'm trying to say, Jeff, when you study real history, not a construct that has been tried to be, listen, folks, these people were here 1,500 years before the Hebrews were even thought of. So where was the Christian God? Where was the, New, the Old Testament God during? People will say, well, it was Abraham. You don't know Abraham. You don't know where he came from. You have no idea what his family did. You have no understanding of the Chaldeans. You have no idea of the city of Ur, which was a province of Sumer. No. And Brittany, I think it's clear that the spell did not work on you. And there's many of us, many of us that the spell does not work on, that the spell will not work on, it's fact. that the spell never works on. There's something within us that says, wait a minute, this isn't right. Wait a minute, this isn't true. And we always hear the saying, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. That's true for men. And it's also true for what we would call gods, because there's always been some of us that the spell doesn't work on. There will always be some of us that the spell doesn't work on. And ladies and gentlemen, today, we now have the ability to be, boom, in contact with people all over the globe yeah. just that fast. So I'm telling you, I don't think it's going to be as easy to conquer us this time as they think I don't think so be. either. Listen, folks, something happened, Jeff. Jeff, 100 years ago, we didn't know about these people. We didn't understand they are us. They sent us a message in the bottle. And if it wasn't for the fact of the conflicts that began in Iraq, in ancient um, Iran, what we call the cradle of creation. Now, it's, we have to pay attention to their gods. Now, everyone knows of the legends now of Nibiru that supposedly came from um, the guy who interpreted, what, what is his name, 12th Planet. Um, Are we talking about one Zachariah Sitchin? Thank you, thank you. Let me tell you, folks, the guy screwed up. He was so limited. He never consulted the real professors, the real cats that were actually in the Museum of Philadelphia, in the Museum of Iraq, in the Museum of the Louvre, and the British Museum where these tablets reside. Stitchin was never given direct access to begin to decipher. And, and it wasn't until recently that when Professor Kramer, who is now the leading, he's the one, listen, if they had an issue, and they still do if they have new tablets, and they're discovering them all the time. This is the guy that will go there and do the uh, transcribing. So I'll take his word. He's a university professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'll take his knowledge over Stitchin's superstitions. 
And that's all I can say. So here's what we do know. They did have Enki, Enyel, and Ayana, and who was our other friend, the moon god? Wayne, can I ask a question? Sure. How do we know that those gods and those people are any more real than the gods and people that are written about in the Bible? How do we know it's not just somebody else's stories? Well, because here we can actually do dating. But I mean, I know we, those people believed it, but how do we know that what they believed was true? Well, I mean, you have to think about the human species, us as a species. This was I mean, the gods specifically. How do we know those gods were even real and they weren't just other people's stories? Well, you know, at some point, you know, when you're looking for the pandemic, you have to go to patient zero. So we know the Old Testament, that, that the, the book of Genesis is really... Folks, the first 10 chapters is speculation. It, we know it came from, for instance, go and look at the Chaldean record. Look at the Akkadians. Why did the Akkadians invade Samaria? Well, it's because they began, the Akkadians started an empire. The thing about the Akkadians was, and we all talk about the Akkadian record. Guess where they got their written language from? The Samaritans. So why I think it's important this is mankind putting to stone tablet record of his beliefs. Now, were they original? Are they real? I don't, how can you say they're not any more real than what our gods of the 21st century are? That was exactly my question. How do we know that those gods are any more real than the gods of Genesis? I agree with you hundred percent. Genesis is speculative. It is. Genesis is probably little more than fiction. Ergo, if Genesis is based mainly on the Sumerian writings, then how do we know that the gods of Sumer are any more real than the gods of Genesis? Well, according to what I'm reading uh, in their religion, how they started 6,000 years ago, a thing, Enki put a spell, and I'm just reading what the record said, mm -hmm. um, on humanity, on this planet. And apparently Inyel and his mother have been trying, and this is, and this is where the record kind of just fades off into, to counter what Enki did to us. Now, there has been speculation more and more, I hear in more and more circles, more and more different trains of thought. Everyone keeps coming back. Well, if the Sumerian record is in fact the first true written record that we have, that we can now understand their mindset, we understand their culture, we understand their economy, we understand their laws, um, this begins to put it into context that humanity was not a bunch of nomadics walking around somewhere in the Middle East desert. It was quite the opposite. And Even we found that in North America, and this has been hidden from us, there were great cities built and run by the people that were native or at least first in the American continent. It wasn't, the, we had this idea of the American Indians as being a bunch of savages running around, you know, with loincloths on and, and they actually had great cities and great uh, civilizations. And AJ, I understand your, opinion but when you come into this chat room you have to do more than just to repeat your opinion over and over and over so if you can't offer some data then i will ask you respectfully and we know your opinion stop offering it over and over and over or i will help you stop offering it over and over and over that's a spell by the way he's recanting a spell when you start repeating something over and over again he's actually a spell caster and oh man, that's AJ. profound that's profound aj man don't kill the messenger, dude. I'm just telling you. AJ, think about it. You are casting a spell. You're repeating a mantra over and over and over. That's what it is. You're not saying abracadabra, but you're saying abracadabra. Same. Yeah. And let's talk about when we talk about here in North America, up in Nova Scotia, we're now finding out that the original people who settled those lands were from Asia. They're Asian. And there's so, speculation that they, the ones in the North America might even have been of some sort of Hebraic origin that they might actually Phoenician origin. Yeah. Um, this is and the Phoenicians were the great travelers. 
So in this book, not not AJ Karlovic. I'm, there's a AJ AJAK92. That's what I'm talking about. Who we're talking to? <laughs> so in this book here, the Nephilim Chronicles: The Fallen Angels in the Ohio Valley by Frank Zimmerman. Oh my! Um, this is pretty cool because he actually, as an archaeologist, they've done the dugs. Really, you know, there was the Cahokia Mounds where I used to live there in St. Louis. And right. yeah, I mean, so there was an ancient culture here, folks, in North America that were highly evolved. But Wayne, does it have to be fallen angels? Why couldn't no. it have just been the native peoples? Well, I think that there is something to that. There is something outside of us. I mean, I can't live in the construct that where humanity, our species, is the only species here. I happen to take the position, you know why we can't see the aliens? They don't want us to see them. Hmm. They have cloaking technology, and I actually want to show you something on this. Hmm. There's a patent dealing with a technology that could cloak a planet. And, hmm. you know, um, Carl Sagan speculated it. Um, you know, Hawking speculates that a true intelligence, they wouldn't want to be seen. Right. There's too much threat out there. Why do you want to put up the guy? Hey, guy, come out over here. And they're smarter than you? <laughs> yeah, that's a good well, How about this idea, Wayne? You know, we, talk, we just talked about those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. What if the, the, the people, you know, the controllers, whoever or whatever they are, the writers of history, history is written by the winners, who's in control, those are the ones that have won. What if they, you know, it, it had to be angels come and build these things. It had to be aliens that built the pyramids. It had to be aliens that built the works down in Central America. What if it was just really, really smart, really, really ascended, really, really powerful people just like you and I that did this? didn't need any gods, didn't need any aliens, did it ourselves because we had realized and recognized and accessed our divinity and our freedom. And all these stories from Anunnaki all the way down of all these gods that came and did all this stuff are just reasons and ways to prevent us from knowing that we did it. And let me just, just with uh, all due respect, submit that maybe this is the thing that they're really trying to keep us from learning. What the Christ said, Ye are gods. Who's ye? You and me. We are gods. And in case you're saying, oh, well, Jesus was, you know, the Christ was just talking about something other. He was conjugating a, a Greek verb and blah, blah, blah. Well, what the word really means, you are gods. You are, you are gods, gods. You are gods generally. You are the owner of all things. And maybe that's the big secret that they want to keep us ignorant of, that we are the owner of all things, that we are the creators, that we are G-O-D, you and me, G-O-D. Maybe that's the big secret of history. All right. I was grew up with the Star Trek generation, so I always loved Spock's point of view, that in every myth or legend, it is always there is a foundation of truth somewhere. So hear me on this. So. We've been confused, we, we, not myself, indoctrinated as a Christian. The Bible was the only true written word of God. And we now know, so hear me out. The Genesis 126 people, what if they are the ones running the show? Because we don't ever know what happened to them. They apparently were without sin, they were perfect, Apparently, they didn't have the breath of this story of this Elohim or whatever you want to call them in the nostrils. They didn't get that. Where'd they go? Did they ascend to the natural position? I don't know. Did they meet resistance? I mean, if there is a creator, then that implies that there is more than just one creation. And I can't limit myself any longer that all creations are bipedals. Yeah. I mean, well, the Genesis 126 people were, the Genesis 126 people are still in charge. They just don't know it. The Genesis 126 people, I'm part of them. See, and we're taking over. 
See, I think that this is what I'm trying to say is that that bloodline wasn't contaminated. There's no record of it being contaminated. Now, the Genesis 2-7 bloodline is contaminated. And you go through the whole mantra for the rest of your Old Testament all the way into your New Testament to somehow or another right the ship of a contaminated blood species. Folks, it really is. I mean, that's the whole sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His blood, which was pure. His blood that went into the Holy of Holies and sanctified the utensils of worship. Once Allegedly. again. Well, you know, that's the, that's the story, and I know it well. I always kind of chuckle when people say, you know, Wayne, you ought to read your Bible. I go, really? If anyone would love to come and debate me one-on-one, -on -one, come on. Because <laughs> it won't end well. It, the point is, Jeff, you and I know what we're talking about. We're not making this thing up. And I try to tell people is that the minute you obscure a point of view, and try to diminish it, it's showing your vulnerability. True? I mean, if you have a true belief system, it should be able to withstand any sort of scrutiny, any, any amount of criticism. Do and you it, folks really believe that Christ was real and that he got crucified after all these years? Oh, folks, come on. Folks. Sometimes I wonder what I've been doing for five years, talking to myself. I mean, come on, folks. There is no evidence. None. In you fact, know, Wayne Ashley, if we talk just anthropologically, if we talk just historically, there is not so much as one scrap of a fragment that talks at all about the reality of the life of Jesus. Even the dude, Philo, that lived in that area, that wrote a history of the Judeans of the first 50 years, the only cur current writing during the time of Jesus that we know of, great big huge show trial, death, resurrection, and somehow in the history of the Judeans, he didn't find his way to mention it even one time. And he was not a, 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 a Christian. He was not a believer. He was a objective historian. There was no Jesus, folks. You can't prove it. It never happened, folks. It is. Never. So here's some great books. Number one, you can get, uh, I've talked to Dan, Unmasking It. Is, uh, the, is he a Brit? Um, no, actually. Look, look how he spelled Unmasked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he did that purposely. And, you know, when you start reading these things, folks, uh, this is the one I highly recommend. Anyone who's having. I can't see that. Okay, uh, let me pull it out for you. Yeah, here it is. Nailed. Anyone who has a problem with the breaking the God spell, this is the book you need to read. It'll help explain. Listen, folks, do you really think that there was someone named Jesus in the first century, 35 AD? Really? Do you when the J didn't even exist? Come on. And do you think that he, he didn't, he didn't have a Hebraic name? Uh, listen, you know, folks, you, I, I always tell people this. This was the best one that really broke it for me. In the 24th chapter of the book of Acts, or 21st, excuse me, Paul is standing before King Agrippa and Felix, the governor. And supposedly he's giving his testimony between Agrippa and Agrippa says, Paul, you've lost your freaking mind, man. You know, what is wrong with you? And then Paul says this, well, this is how I come to know the vision is true. A vision, folks. That's all Paul ever saw was a vision. Anyway, he goes and says to King Agrippa, as I was on the road to Damascus, a bright light came down and knocked me to the ground in the party I was with. And that word's only used twice in the New Testament. The other time is when Christ said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He said, and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you stepping on my dick? It hurts when you crush my balls. I didn't write it. And here comes it. I, Saul, said, who are you, Lord? And the voice spoke in the Hebraic tongue and said, Saul, Saul, 
I am Jesus Christ, Christ of Nazareth, who you persecute. That is a GD lie. Because here's the God spell, folks. They love putting the Hebrew in when it suits the story of the crucifixion of the cross. But here, suddenly, they're doing the translation for us from Hebrew into perfect English. Doesn't work, folks. My second piece of evidence. Paul is on the road to Ephesus. As he enters into the promenade, he is, and he gets into the amphitheater, and you can read it for yourself. And Paul stands up and he says, Great men of Ephesus, as I was walking through the promenade, I happened to see all the statues dedicated to all the gods. And then I came upon the one that had no statue at all, and it said, this is dedicated to the unseen God. I hear good gentlemen Ephesus here come proclaim that I represent that God, the unseen God that has no name. Now, you know why they stoned him? Because less than 100 yards was the Jewish synagogue. If Paul was truly a Jew, he would have known the name of the Jewish God. Which God is Paul saying that he is worshiping here? Crow asked a good question. Crow B1, oh, Crow B1 Kenobi. I see what you did with that. That's nice. And I can't tell if it's a he or a she, but they ask, how can you use scripture to prove certain points, but not others? What scripture we don't need to talk about? Well, the one that you were, I think they're referencing the one that you were talking about, Paul. I don't agree completely with your, your interpretation, but I believe, I think you're on the right track. But how can we pull out a scripture in the Bible to use to show that Paul was deceived and throw out all the other scriptures? Listen, I don't buy Paul, the Pauline doctrine. Let me just tell you, first of all, don't buy it at all. And you can't buy it either, because if you want to really buy the Pauline scriptures, then I challenge you to live according to what he wrote in 1 Corinthians. All you women, take your makeup off. You have no right to be speaking at all, particularly in a religious service. I mean, how far do you want to take this? You can't have it both ways, folks. You can't have an imaginary human that somehow, let me ask you something. How'd they get the body down? I mean, you want to talk about crucifixions. Yeah, how'd, and here's how'd they get the body down. And by the way, where'd they find the trees? I mean, you don't think about this thing, folks. Do you know how precious wood was? And by the way, the Romans were very good litigious record keepers. The only record of the Romans crucifying a Jew was in 69 AD by Titus. It's the only record. Well, talking about how, how can we use um, some scriptures and not other scriptures, well, it's the way you use any other data. You look at the data, you weigh the data, and you decide which data is good, which data is, is uh, erroneous. And in my, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't know it all, but I've been studying the Bible for 36 years. I have 100,000 hours invested in its study. And I think you get to the point where you, you develop a spiritual sensitivity and you have to just know, first of all, you can look at the text, you can look at the context, you can look at the language, there's a lot of clues. And that'll get you down to probably maybe 50-50, real, not real. But once you begin to employ your spirituality, once you begin to listen for what's diamond and what's dung, you'll come up to the point where 80% of it is fairy tales and stories, and about 20% of it is some of the greatest, most powerful yeah. writings that were ever given to man. So how do you know what's true and what's real? You just have to know what's true and what's real. You know, people that work with money, you know how they, they learn to – uh, decide what's counterfeit currency and what's not counterfeit currency. They don't handle counterfeit currency much. They handle true currency so much that as soon as they touch a counterfeit bill, they're able to sense the difference almost intuitively. That's how you do it. You read it, you look at it, you study it, and you meditate upon it. And then all of a sudden, as you keep learning and meditating, 
you know there is no shortcut. I'd like to bring up some history, Jeff. In 512, what happened to the Christian faith? It was called the Great Schism. It's where we had the first division of Catholicism, Protestantism. It was the Great Revolt. The Catholic Church tried to put it down at the death of many, many people. But I love what Pope Leo X had to say. How well we know what a profitable superstition this fable of Christ has been for us. There is a book that I would highly recommend everyone read, and this is Caesar's Messiah. Because you're probably not going to like this too much, but if the story of Samer now, which was not known when the Caesars were in power, we have a conundrum here, Jeff, because we can't say that what we have been taught all of our lives and what the recent history is, folks, there was no Jesus Christ. I mean, there never was a man with the name Jesus. Get it out of your head. And people can't handle that. I heard one guy write me and he said, it's our choice who we call our Lord and Savior. And I said, really? Where, where'd you get that at? You know, names are very important. Definitions, Jeff, are very important. If you're in a court case, your case can be won or lost on the fact of your ignorance. If you don't understand definitions, you could be at a terrible disadvantage. And Jeff, it's just what I'm trying to say. You and I know this, and it's not that we're bashing anyone. It's just that the fact that if the Samaritan people existed, if in fact that their culture is our culture today, which we have the records now that validate that, we can see that mankind in general has advanced very little in 6,000 years, very little. Or have we regressed? Was there a high ah. point of culture and then we regress? Because Enki, you know what he did on this spell? It stopped, are you ready for this? And the Samaritan record is written, he stopped the golden ascension of humanity. Mm -hmm. Mankind was on, I, I think, Jeff, for myself, I'm formulating this as I'm going, but it seems like we were really heading somewhere. We really were. Now, let's just take legends, myths, and what we think is truth. We can all say that the interesting thing about the Tower of Babel is where the story takes place. It takes place in Sumer. Very interesting. And we know out of that event, confusion reigned. Now, was the story in Genesis 10 the story of the spell of Enki? I would say no, but it's po certainly possible. Well, I mean, the whole idea of the Tower of Babel has been turned on its head, pardon the pun, because Babel was not unrepentant, bad man rebelling against a good no, God. No. It was a rebellion of good men against a bad God. My and point. it almost worked. It almost worked. And I believe it would have worked if the people that became the Hebrews hadn't sold out the people that were rebelling against the God. That's my opinion. Well, I'm saying that those gods were Enki. It's very interesting that in Christianity, they, they adapt the Trinity idea. Very interesting in the, the gods of ancient Sumer, you had, um, you had, let me just get it out. You had Enki, Enyel, and their mother, um, Nana. Right. And of course, the Trinity concept is almost ubiquitous in ancient religions. It is. In fact, if you study Philo, um, you know, he was actually a, a, a big proponent of the Trinity. He was the first one actually brought in the concept to the Hebrews of God being called Father. Um, but I, I contend this. I think there's something here. I, I, I can't put my finger on it, but if I can take the first here, and I'm writing, I'm going to do a whole series on it, um, that these people have in the written record. And listen, talk about discipline. They got one story in here of a scribe who has a son. He's an ingrate. He tells his son, he said, you're so disrespectful. You expect everything to be given you. He said, I never put you behind the ox. I never 
told you to bring in the firewood to keep me warm as other scribes put their sons to work. I have given you everything and yet you dishonor me by not going to school and hanging out and you're reading this story and it could sound like a story today. These are not primitive stone age cavemen. They had cities, they had plumbing, they had crops, they turned a salt marsh into fertile fields. They had trade, they were on the oceans. I mean, the, where the gap of the Bible brings in, because the thing about the Bible is that you look at this, geone this geology, genealogy, excuse me, that takes place, Jeff, it's got huge gaps and it's very narrow, but what's the strange thing about it is, that story is Samaria. All we have a report in the chat room that Inky lives under the Vatican and is 10 feet tall. I don't know. Listen, um, I just know this. It would be foolish to discount their religious belief systems because their religious belief systems are ours. Every yeah, but my point being, Wayne, if their religious systems are ours, how do we know that theirs are any more true than ours? Well, you could go they through. They were making stuff up just like we are. I know it's, the, it's definitely the most ancient. It's definitely the source of most of the creation myths. But how do we know that they were right any more than we know that the Hebrews were right? Well, you could go through life with that. Um, at some point in time. And I have, and I continue yeah. to. At some point in time, there is a starting point. You can't have instantaneous life combusting into it. It doesn't work that way. Absolutely, but I, I think we err if we give carte blanche to anybody's ideas of gods and stop searching within our own hearts for the reality of gods. Well, I postulate... We are the gods. We are the gods. Why are we looking for gods somewhere else? We're gods, but that's just me. Well, you see, now, if we go on that route, people can't handle that because they've been taught, their core beliefs tell them that is blasphemy. You're comparing yourself to God. But here's the strange well, thing. The, the Christ said that we are gods, with all due respect. I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Well, actually, that's how it actually is written in the very beginning. I mean, what if you mean? read the Apocrypha, mm -hmm. the book of Adam and Eve, uh, the Apocalypse, according to Adam, if you read those Apocrypha books, which to me is, has just as much credibility as Genesis, Exodus, all the rest of them, um, is the fact that Seth knew he, get this folks, thou shalt have no other graven image before you. Mm -hmm. Yet the Catholic church and all churches have all were graven itching. But here's the point. Literally what you could say in Genesis 2, 7, we are the graven image of God. Or you could say, don't have any other idols before the God. Don't, I will have no gods before me. When you're saying that in first person, I will place no divinity, no deity, no sovereignty above me. I will have no God before me. I'm the God. Christ, uh, John wrote the last guy in the the last guy that wrote in the whole Bible, the very last Bible writer, the one that knew the Christ better than anybody, the one that was the apostle that Christ loved, said, "Beloved, now, not someday, not maybe, not hopefully. Now we are." baby Elohim, the sons of God. Yeah, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. What's that mean? Now we're sons of God. And guess what? One of these days we're going to grow up and we're going to be gods of gods. We're Elohim in training, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't say it. The Christ said it. And why are we looking for gods elsewhere? If you want to see a God, go look in the nearest reflective surface. You're divine. You're sovereign. You're free. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And I think our, our, listen, I lay hands on myself. I listen, I, as you should, you know, I learned a lot. You know, I don't discount the fact that the lessons that I learned in Christianity weren't same of the very same principles that were taught elsewhere. But those lessons aren't Christian lessons, Wayne. You no, no. know that. Oh yeah. They were imported. Listen, I tell people, and they but I mean, they don't teach their, your sovereignty, your divinity, your freedom. They teach oh, that you're no. a slave, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Yeah. Yeah. That, At best you're a sinner saved by grace. Yeah, and there's a lot of controversy as to that grace message, you know, because, exactly. it, you know, it certainly doesn't go with the uh, Jewish message. And when you go, well, where did Christianity come from? Listen, if you study history, 
you'll find out that Jerusalem in 30, 35 AD was a military occupied uh, province of the Eastern Front of Rome. Yeah. Um, that you had, and, and people don't study history. You had Vespasian. How many in the chat room, and you're watching it, Jeff, know who Vespasian is? Mm -hmm. Anyone? And guys, you hear what he just said, and this is true. I've talked about it before. Israel was Roman occupied territory. Every word that was published on paper, on stone, on parchment in Israel in first century AD had to go through this place called the Roman censor. So every single word, as Scotty Roberts, who knows who Vespasian is, every <laughs> single word that was written in first century Rome was read, vetted, and approved by your friendly neighborhood, one world order, one world government, Roman empire. But wait, it also got vetted down in the 17th century by the one world order, one world government, Britons. You're reading the Donald Trump version. You're reading the Ob Barack Obama version. Deal with it. It's true. Yeah, because if you understand in 35 AD, folks, Aspasian was fighting these Jews. I mean, they were like fleas to them. They, 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 they did uh, terrorist attacks on Roman troops um, many times in the encampments. Uh, and we're not talking small battles here, folks. We're the talking... Spacing was born on November 17th. Ah, isn't that interesting? Um, battles, thousands of men dying, uh, mm -hmm. brutal deaths. I mean, listen, the Romans, when you read about your miracle about Jesus casting the demon out right there in the city of the Decropolises, uh, folks, that's a typology. That was actually Vespasian putting to death 3,000 renegade Jews that were following a Messiah. And their deaths were recorded. We know because Josephus recorded the deaths. Um, the problem is, folks, if you know what history was taking place, the history of your Bible could have never happened. It just I love the random questions. Why did Hitler do what he did? Why do you breathe? <laughs> You know, I mean, that's a good question, but it's a little bit out of context. Yeah, I Use don't the know. Context right now. You know, I, I don't think we know even the full impact of these situations and that they changed world history. Scotty Roberts says it would be interesting to have Trisha do Vespasian's numbers. That would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, Vespasian was. I'll was, have her do that later today. He was no. Listen. You don't understand history. And that's, Jeff, I think that's what we're trying to tell people. If you read Caesar's Messiah, you'll find out how they did it. When Titus, Flavius, by the way, and do you understand now? Might I suggest you could read this too for yes, more on that story? Yes, yes. Flavius Josephus, folks. Scotty Roberts did the cover. Beautiful, by the way. So the Flavians, you've got to understand who the Flavians, the Herodians, and the Alexandrians were. You didn't understand the power base of the political world back then. Paul was a Herodian. He was. Absolutely he was. And what Titus did, um, folks, you don't understand Titus. This was, Pilate could have never done what he did in the story of the myth of the New Testament. He'd have lost his freaking head, folks. Titus was the general that destroyed Jerusalem. Yes, he was. And let me tell you how. And his did. Jewish lieutenant is the one that told him how to get into the temple because the guy's dad had created and donated the temple doors. There's a little nugget for you. Yes. And so when they broke through those heavy bronze door, they went directly to the sacred six scriptures, took them back to Rome. Guess who helped decipher them? Oh, folks, they had more traitors than you can. It took them 40 years to contrive the story. Paul what, was back there in Rome. They backdated the story 40 years. And if you don't believe me, the gospel of Mark was never written by any dude named Mark never was. At best, what we can find, it was an outline by a person who had the name, and it wasn't James. Who was the other name? for It was Yasha, Joshua. Or, fact is, we don't know where it came from, and that's the problem we have with this. So Titus, folks, it was bloody. It took the Romans three years to build 
at the wall around Jerusalem. They had to import the wood from Lebanon and around. Night and day, they worked in building that wall, and Titus set siege, wouldn't allow the Jews in on the high holy days to the temple. For three years, he kept them out. And then when the wall had been completed and they lacked the last part, he allowed all Jews free access to Jerusalem. During Passover. Exactly. The city swelled to over one million inhabitants. Titus closed the gate. Yep. Within three weeks, they were eating their own. They turned to cannibalism. Yeah. Yes, they did. That's your Christianity, folks. It's fact. And very interestingly, go ahead, Wayne. I just want to find, I need well, to find a date. What I'm trying to say is that people, they, you don't know history. Listen, I keep on contending. The Christian faith is the only faith that the last, the first books were written last. The gospels were written after, written after the epistles. And five years before Rome started their siege on Jerusalem, the Christ said, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is the Roman army beginning to surround Jerusalem, let those that are in there get the hell out of Dodge. Those that listened to the Christ lived and went to be able to put their, their, their writings out other places. If it weren't for those people that listened to the Christ five years earlier, we wouldn't know any of this story. We wouldn't know. And people write me and they really bash me. They say, well, I've been to Jerusalem and I've seen the Holy Sepulchre. You haven't seen anything, folks. Listen, by the time Rome, the Romans got, the Titus got finished with it and his brother, there wasn't a stone left standing in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And they actually plowed the place where the, uh, the, the temple had stood. Yeah. There wasn't anything left, folks. And for nearly a millennium, it was a wasteland. So now all of a sudden, archaeologists are finding, you know, these, come on, folks. It's a tourist land. It's Disneyland that with the religious spin on it. And folks, don't lose out the fact that these end-time eschatology idiots, these people that are pushing this whole idea of the end times, that Matthew 24 is about to come. Matthew 24 happened in AD 70. There, it's over, folks. It's over. It's already happened. Don't believe the Jesuit lies because they're trying to confuse you to the fact of what happened in AD 70. Read the book as it's supposed to be. History, not yes. future. And that's what happened. And Jeff, you're right. People don't understand those writers. Listen. Because they don't want to understand. They're babies and they're lazy. They want their ears tickled. Yeah. Um, they wrote for their brethren. And, and listen, folks, there wasn't anything known as Christians. It was a lot of different small groups of faith who had the story passed down. They didn't have printing presses out there. And if there was a letter, you know, I challenge people, well, where's the letter to the Lodiceans? I mean, Paul makes reference to it. Why don't we have that letter? This is the only chronological New Testament in existence that I know of the Diamond New Testament, in response to the question in there the chat room. So we have to begin to dig deep. And my point is this, folks. We debate these mythological legends, stories that we call Christianity. Thank God. you, Rebecca. But we want to deny the history now. You can't have it both ways, folks. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, I don't know where this thing started. I really don't. I postulate that this thing is called thought, that we are enveloped in this thing called thought. Everything has to start from thought. And maybe you can bring something into existence. Maybe you can have thought that is so advanced that you can bring molecules together and have the knowledge. I don't and Scotty Roberts makes a good point. We have to remember that not, they, some of them escaped from Jerusalem. Yeah. And they went to a place called Masada. Yes. And so important were the things that those people had taken from Jerusalem to Masada that guess what? The Romans did the same thing at Masada and killed all of those people. And somebody says, well, Jeff, didn't it take you years to accept that Jesus was a lie? 
Yes, it did, but I didn't have me giving me all the data. So I don't why do you want to take years to accept something? If you touch a hot, if you touch a hot burner, how long does it take you to decide to take your finger off of it? One woman wrote to me, so what do we do now? And I said, are you kidding? You're on the most exciting exploration of discovery you're ever going to be on. Listen, God exists. I think that there's something above even the concept of God. All I know now, Jeff, and this is, this is the absolute my heart speaking here. I am more aware of the presence of this majesty beyond comprehension. I don't have the fear of death anymore. You know what? I stopped beating myself up. For over 50 years, I lived in this mind coitus that I would do something bad and expect to be punished. I do something good and expect the recognition for it. And when I didn't get it, I began to feel cheated. And as I started going through life, I kept on running into people who called themselves Christians, but were barbarians. I would go to church on Sunday and I would see the wolves standing on the front and the sheeple coming through. I yep. can tell you I'm free of that because you see that concept of love is not conditional. And Scotty Roberts makes another good point. King David, the man after God's own heart probably didn't even exist. No. And if he did, he was a golem, as I've suggested on this channel. You can look it up, Jeff Darty, David, golem. And the ether exists. Listen, the Hebrews. All right, you ready for this? Don't spam me, bro. <laughs> hey, man, no spam. <laughs> not going to let that happen, Steve G. You think I'm not looking, but I'm looking. Uh, uh, the thing is, is that we can take this knowledge now. And this is how I've been processing. I was reading last Wayne, I know I'm interrupting you, but this is just too good. Scotty Roberts. I had an old seminary professor of mine tell me, Scotty, remember, you have to filter your history through the faith. Ah, yes, 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 yes. You know, the thing about filters are, they're going to leave it according to the filter. <laughs> you know, you're not yep. going to see it. Uh, Scotty's spot on. You know, I always like this is what the Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Fuchs, told me. He said, you people stole our God. They can keep him. They can have him back. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm taking his advice. I never did convert. And, you know, Jeff, it started from somewhere. The Egyptians got their language from the Samaritans. They're saying that the influence of India was from Samar. They sent out their emissaries bearing, and they called their emissaries light bearers. And I also found something else that's really weird, is that the serpent was not considered evil. Actually, a serpent was considered a high esteem in society. Absolutely. Ubiquitously throughout history, yeah. the great myths. And I'm going, and I don't mean myths are untrue. I just mean they're great epic yeah. stories. So here's this snake again, you know, and I'm going, hmm, this snake, it shows up everywhere. Why did the Christ say be wise as serpents and gentle as doves? Gentle as dove, exactly. You know, we, we, we've got to get out of this. And, and Jeff, I agree with you. I believe we are on that ascension, but I also have a sense we're almost going through like birth pains. You know, these are contractions that we're going through, and I think they're going to get a little bit more intense, and I think more and more people are waking up. We know this. The Pew Research Company, has, uh, they've done their studies. The Barner Group has done their studies. The Christian religion is seeing an exodus, as all religions are. They don't report these like that, but the fact that all religions are finding their people waking up and saying, wait a minute. There has to be more to this, because if I take the position as a Christian, as I did, that means, and I believed in the rapture, by the way, I believed that there was going to get God in his mercy through Jesus Christ was going to take his saints up and out of this thing and judgment was coming to the world. And what I didn't realize, I was the world's biggest racist and bigot, because what I was saying, hey, I got the ticket, too bad for you. See you, Jack. And that's how most people take it. Well, Not to mention that story was invented by the Jesuits of whole, in whole cloth. There you go. 
And then you think about, let's take it from the Muslim perspective. Well, if you don't convert to Islam, then all the rest of us are infidels. Well, that's a very highly prejudicial point of view. What they're saying in all these religions is that it's your group, you're the right ones, and everyone else is going to go to this place called hell. Folks, do you hear what they're doing to us? And remember, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, same God. Same God. But we're same players. It's all right. I've never seen a Buddhist come on my channel and ever try to proselytize their belief. Yeah. And Wayne, there's a statement, and this I love it when people get to this point. When this happens, my work here is done. Someone named Secret Service, glad to have you here, says, I don't know what to believe anymore. Good for you. That means you've become unindoctrinated. And now you're ready to start learning again. You've cleared your mind of crap. Now you can start learning. You've, you've vomited up. You've voided all of the poison that's been in your system. Now your system will be purified, and you can begin to assimilate truth. Congratulations, Secret Service. Way to go. Don't know what to believe anymore. Celebrate it. This is a day, November, whatever it is, 19th, 2017. You look back and say, that was the beginning of it all. Congratulations. Way to go. And that's what you're going to find. It did it for me. I've told my story before. When I found out they had lied to me about the name of the Christ, all my life I've been praying to something called Jesus and come to find out it was made up. I mean, it, it crushed me, folks. I cried in a fetal position. It crushed me that hard because, you see, I had been trained properly in understanding that names are everything. And think what they did to you, Wayne. Not only was there this name of Jesus that you prayed to, but there's only one name given under heaven among men, whereby men can be saved, the name of Jesus. So they made sure that if you stuck to the name of Jesus, that you could never, ever be saved because it's a fake name. They wanted to keep you locked in this matrix forever. Yep. And I'll tell you what really pissed me off, Jeff, is that when I realized that the name didn't exist until 1654 on the second writing of the King James, the first one didn't have it. It was Jesus. Absolutely. Well, we can't have that because then that means that you're worshiping Zeus. No shit. Excuse me. Uh, no crap. Um, but we and can't they, handle it. And they are. And we were. Because actually the son of God is Titus. Yeah, I know. It, it, could you imagine all Christendom, all these Christians are worshiping Titus. He is the son of God. That's what he got the title of. De Gunyan. So it, it, when I figured that out, when I, when I recovered from that, and it took, it took my wife and I a long time, and we didn't believe it. That's why we went out and bought books like The Search. We wanted to read this. Then we started getting other books, and we, then we started getting history books. Oh, no, don't read history. You got you to gotta filter history through your faith, Wayne. <laughs> yeah. And Didn't you your... listen to Dr. Roberts? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's not a doctor, but he played one on TV. Yes. And, and people don't understand. I mean, I was in the mindset of Oral Roberts, uh, Catherine Coleman, Kenneth Hagan. I mean, that's where I came up through, folks. Dude, um, Catherine Coleman? Yeah. If anybody was ever a witch, Catherine Coleman was a witch. Go back and listen to her and watch her. Her, I, I never even thought about this until just now. Her speech, her mannerisms, her appearance, she was so, she was casting spells and drawing people in. Do you remember how she talked? Ooh, ladies and gentlemen. She was, oh man, I get, Catherine Kuhlman <laughs> was a dark witch. I gotta, I'm going to write that down. We got to talk about Catherine Kuhlman, even though nobody knows who she is. Yeah, I mean, Benny Hinn's mentor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I studied all this thing, and so when I see people who write these terrible things that call themselves Christians, I'm going, "Well, you're not exhibiting First Corinthians thirteen four and eight. And you know, the thing is, is that I always challenge. So you're telling me that God is a Christian? Is that what you're saying? God, God is a Christian. See, that's what I ask all my friends that are still in that mindset. So is God a Christian? Can I ask that in the chat room? Is God a Christian? 
Here's a great point too, Wayne. Deborah Tucker says, just think about it. What do we teach our children to pray? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You're giving your soul to the Lord. Oh, and if bye. I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You're selling your soul, and it's not to rock and roll. Uh, Lord literally translates ball. It does. I mean, can you see what we've done to ourselves? We've given ourselves into deities that we've got no freaking idea what we did. People you know, I'll watch this, Wayne. Yeah. Tell me that's not a witch, ladies and gentlemen. That's Catherine Kuhlman, ladies and gentlemen. Johnny Roberts for that. Watch man, that. Man, I tell you what, I just like I'm in the freaking Wizard of Oz, man. I exactly. mean Exactly. <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> it's like the rat said, forget the cheese. It's get me out of the trap. Exactly. <laughs> you see, folks, listen, I love people. I love my species. I'm tired, Jeff, of seeing our species sacrifice our blood for unseen deities. My God, we need to be hugging each other, not killing each other. Look at that. Boy, that's just freaky. If that doesn't give you chills, there's something wrong with you. I'm sitting here covered with chills and not in a good way. That's a witch, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, my pretty. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing she's missing, Wayne, is some flying monkeys. And I'm not sure about this guy in the background. Um, yeah, folks. I mean, this and, and and they try to tell us that, you know, seeing um astrology, um, divination, that this is evil. And I'm going, folks, I've been in some services. I'm not sure what I saw. Because how do you define, if you've never experienced something, how do you know it's good or bad? You're going to probably make your foundation of your cognitive thought because someone said, Wayne, this is the Holy Spirit. Where it could have been just the opposite. Someone could have said in, Wayne, this is the devil himself. Just depends how you are introduced to it. Yeah. Good, you're gonna... good find, Scotty Roberts. That's exactly Thank you, Scotty. what I was thinking. Thank you. That's, that's some good stuff right there. And notice that Benny also dress, dresses in white all the time, just like Catherine always did. Um, Except when he's hanging out with Paula White in Rome, holding hands. They were having – they had a sexual romp in Rome, and it's documented. Paula White, Benny Hinn, and yet people are still giving millions of dollars to Paula White and Benny Hinn. How stupid are people, Wayne? There's pictures of Paula White and Benny Hinn holding hands, records that they were in the same hotel room with one bed, and people still give those idiots money. I, 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 listen, I developed a payment system for churches, and what I saw in the years that I was going to churches, talking to these leaders, I'll tell you what, it sickened me. And you know what it sickened me most about, Jeff? is that I saw people in these churches, poor people, people that had to make a decision between food and medicine, that were giving money under this deception that if you give me money, you're giving it to God, and God will make sure, according to 2 Corinthians 9, that he will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Oh, son of a bitches, all they were doing. I can't tell you folks how many homes I were in that were multi-million dollar homes, so mansions of people holding up the Christ message of Jesus and milking them for every penny they got. Do you understand that Paula White and Benny Hinn are using your money to go to Rome and have sex with each other? 
Do you think Jesus is going to bless you for that? Do you think when, when Benny was giving it to Paul, he was saying, thank you, Jesus, for all the, all the offerings and donations? Anyway. You know, she's married to the uh, former... Say, uh, she's married to the keyboardist in Journey. Journey, yeah. Yep. Who got out? Yeah, anyway. So yeah. there you go, folks. If you want to so give folks, your money to them, go ahead. You see, that's what I don't like about that. But whatever you're giving to them, I'll do it for half. <laughs> hey, listen, I have a nonprofit that's tax deductible approved. You can give it to there. The point is, folks, giving isn't going to get you to heaven. And I love how they pull from the Old Testament mm -hmm. the law of tithing. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I thought that we're under grace. But you know, don't say that Paul is not committed. She was definitely taking one for the team with Benny. <laughs> uh, folks, I, I don't get it why we do this. You know, people buy these people, they live them in luxury, and then they make them gods. They do. Yeah, they and, are given to God. They're given to their own little gods. You know, they elevate their own little false gods. They elevate these people to high positions. They put them on pedestals. Because the next word, listen, I went through this thing every year where Kenneth Copeland in the Washington, D.C. Victory Conference would have the word from God about the next year. And I mean, whoa, 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 wait, wait. So that's not divination, but you're going to rack this guy because he practices divination? You hypocrite. There's no doubt that the rat bastard sucks our energy out through prayer. Why are you praying to anybody else? I mean, people say, they ask Dottie me. Dottie says that gives a whole new meaning to thrusting the gospel. <laughs> uh, you know, people say, well, how do you wake up? You know what? I wake up content. I still give thanks for the fact I am not an ingrate. I give thanks to the earth for the fact that I am still here. I give thanks to it, that I can see life around me. I give thanks to the voice, to those that are helping me. And listen, I do believe in unseen entities. Absolutely. You know what, Wayne? Maybe we're being too hard on Paula White, because what could have happened is they got up in the hotel room, and Benny just took off his coat and said, take it! <laughs> just fell out. And Benny had his way with her after that. Oh, I, I just think it's so sad. Listen. If you're going to make a million dollars off the gospel, you're not believing in a, you're taking it from somebody else. That's my point, Jeff. Exactly. And I, I, I tell you, I left one church, I got in my car, and I started crying. I said, my God, what have I done? I built a payment system, a mobile payment system, the very first one for churches. And I left and I said, what have I done? I didn't know the insidiousness of what is taking place in American Christianity today. Mm -hmm. Do you know, Jeff, each year U.S. citizens give to churches over $100 billion every year? Do you know how much money is stolen by church personnel? each year almost 15 billion somebody's reporting and we can't confirm this of course that while they were having sex paula was watching her own tv show over benny's shoulder <laughs> <laughs> oh i shouldn't be laughing that's funny though <laughs> uh, so there you go jeff boy another not your normal <laughs> sunday morning show Oh, it's a, it, it, but it's just the truth, folks. Jeff, Jeff does word studies that, you know, words are important. You words have no things. idea. You get in a legal case, you're going to find out just how important words are. I saw uh, a, an excerpt on a guy, famous quote, he had gotten served some papers, cease and desist. And he made the quote saying, this piece of paper is stronger than all of my money and all of my efforts. And I thought to myself, how true is that in life? You know, I, I did this whole thing on uh, chattel. 
I did not realize this, Jeff, but you and I, everyone listening, we are not a person. We're not. We do not meet the legal definition according to the U.S. Commerce Department. We are not a person. We all are corporations. And someone wrote me yesterday, I've been getting some great information. A corporation is cooperation. And I probably should correct myself. Someone's correcting us that it's probably not true that Paula was looking over Benny's shoulder, yeah, watching yeah. her own show. The truth is that they were engaged in a position that allowed them both to watch their own shows on TV simultaneously during the act. And probably got up in time to do an altar call. Like the way Canadians watch hockey. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So how many we got in the chat room right now? I, I'm surprised that anyone has left. We know that these are really true <laughs> truth seekers. 185 right now. <laughs> uh, Scotty Roberts offers that he does believe Benahan was speaking in tongues, however. Yeah, yeah. I probably was saying, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. That you was know? the altar call, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, it, and, and you're giving your money to these people. Oh. When if I found they out. If believe in the separation of church and state, if the religious people really believe in the separation of church and state, if the government really believes in the separation of church and state, in the 501c3 deduction for religious organizations, pay your own way real separation of church and state let's have it and let's have it now well let's be real candid what the definition of church mean church literally means government religion that's what church literally means it's a government religion um and i look at all these churches now what i see are many corporations yeah they they call themselves a 503 tax you know tax deductible organization but it's crazy, folks. Sorry. It's just crazy, Jeff, it, when you think about this. And um, I, just, I just finally had enough of it. I, I could not find anyone that was living the faith. Oh, I see people pile into the pews every Sunday. You saw it. These people really believed. I did, too. And just for the record, we're not talking about Benny Hill. <laughs> We're talking about Benny Hinn. <laughs> Benny uh, Hill had much more credibility than Benny Hinn. Yes, he really did. He was actually very funny too. Uh, so, but getting back to this, the good news is is that folks, we we are waking up. And you know, people, see, I see how they bash us. I mean, Jeff, we got people who just they hate on us, and I'm going, well, haters got to hate, and. You know, I tried to write one person. They said, well, you have a responsibility uh, in your audience. And I said, listen, my responsibility is not living up to your expectations. I can't live up to my own. I, I certainly can't live up to yours. So get off my back. <laughs> well, even the Christ said, the time to get worried is when everybody says how nice you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. If you're not, you're not much of a cowboy if you aren't taking a few arrows. You know, people can't get over when I'm telling them that this whole thing now, when you look at the enter the net, you get your unique, uh, what I call, indiv your individual prison number. And then now I'm finding out when we're born, we're transferred from a person to a corporation. And I'm going, what kind of messed up matrix is this and jeff i'm being serious we have you look at your birth certificate look at your birth certificate the original copy they're all written on different banks why would a birth certificate be written on a banknote why because they turn it over to the census bureau which is part of the commerce department it's crazy jeff it's crazy so if that's true, how much more of this mind struct are we in? Uh, Jeff, you and I were talking on the death conference, December 10th, right? Right down there in Clearwater, Florida. 
Jeff, I read in the Entrepreneur uh, Magazine, do you know what the number one new business is that get this venture capitalists are investing in? Death. Really? Yes, mm -hmm. sir. You and I have got to talk this thing. Um, for instance, there are companies that are now starting up and I'm Wait, going to get... I have some advice for you though, bef before we go on, I know people are, are coming after you. I just want to give you this advice. What's that? <laughs> Here it comes. Where is that? Come on, tell us, give us your advice. But anyway, she says, shake it off, Wayne. Taylor shake Swift. it off, shake, it, shake off. it off. So if any of you are looking to start a business, if you have entrepreneurship in your DNA, so because of the way the internet is today, and we're so integrated that, are you ready for this? There are companies that are starting up that when you die, they will go in and start removing your digital fingerprint. And it's much more complicated than you can imagine. Um, that's just one of the new areas of starting in death. Uh, there are rapid now developments of being able to, for instance, taking your DNA right now, Jeff, they can take your DNA and when you pass on, when the DNA computing that's now evolving right now advances to the point they believe by taking your digital image, your digital personification, because you and I have one now, Jeff, particularly we're YouTubers that do these videos all the time, they've actually digitized us. That can take that into an artificial intelligence construct with our DNA and they figure by the year 2045, they can actually bring us back in. No thanks. That's where we're going, folks. The point that the article that I was reading is that death is now entered in to the digital age. And it's going to become a huge, huge industry. The fact is, is that the funeral industry that was owned by primarily two families, uh, they've had a monopoly on it here in the United States for hundreds of years, not hundreds, hundreds of years, literally, that that industry is dying. Trick on words on there, because why? People are now realizing that to be buried is not the eco way to go. They now have this process of cremation that can now preserve a portion of us for potential reanimation. And do you, have a, do you have a reference on that? Any um, yeah. ref, you know, data on that? Yeah, let me go in someplace. That's in interesting. Place. I know that they'll, they'll bury you like in this, they put you in this little thing that they can put under a tree and you can fertilize a tree for the rest of your life. Yes, they can. Hold on. Thank you, Lynn, I appreciate that. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to pull this article. Up. I want to go out the Viking way, man. What way is that on the ship? Put me on a little barge, put me on a big bunch of wood, send me out in the lake and then shoot an arrow out and light me on fire. Bro, that's the way to go. Release me back to the elements. I want to go out like a Viking. Yeah. Or like I... a good, good old, uh, Oh, Doc Arte destroyer clan member. Put me in my Scotty Roberts esque um, kilt. Lay me out on some wood, push me out in the water, and light my fire. Light Come my on, baby, fire. light my fire. Oh, I know where I did. Excuse That's me. That's what I want. I do, do. Oh, that right. is what I want. Fire an arrow at me. People have been shooting arrows at me my whole life. Let them shoot one that, that does something for me. Yeah. So to show you this here article, uh, cancel. Hold on one second. Behind the veil says, just put my body in the woods, let the animals eat me in return. Well. I'm here. going to the Georgia Guidestones the week after Thanksgiving. So here you go. You see oh, this one? Shit. So yes. this was uh, NBC News, CBS, CNBC. Uh, Graveyards could become a thing of the past. So here, these are ashes, remains, DNA, and they're in these new um, mosques. I think that this is a 
great uh, opportunity for investors, by the way. You didn't mean to say they're in mosque, did you? No, no. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that was a play on Like mausoleums? Mausoleums. And when you walk in, you simply use a scan code for your number, and they light up, and then it will actually show you where you are actually residing. So yeah. if I put, you know, let's, if you put one of your loved ones in Here one of these is. places, here it is. You walk in and it'll light up and say, oh, there's grandma right there. Yeah, here it is, right here. This is, ha this is the biggest thing in Japan. You know what? I have a hard time thinking that's so bad. It looks kind of cool. It's very cool. Very, very cool. Um, we have to Death begin. stones, it looks like they're called. Yep, yep. I'll put it back up there. That's pretty interesting. So... They get into here as well. I'll leave, you know, everyone can see the article on here. I'll give it to you. Um, it's really changing, folks. The whole paradigm of, now here's a startup called Luca. They create a chat bot that simulates conversations with prints. They eventually- I've seen those gravestones where you can actually, or did I see that on TV? Where you can push a button on top of the gravestone and the person that's in it gives you a message like, thanks for coming to visit me. Yeah, and yeah. Um, eventually, uh, when we start understanding what Watson did when uh, he beat Ken Jennings, that now artificial intelligence is copying you and I. Interesting. So, yeah, it's a great article. Death is a booming new industry. As it should be. Yeah. So isn't it odd? And, and the thing about it is what you're doing on the 10th, this is now, I think other people must be listening because it's like, it's people are becoming aware that their perception of death. Here's the thing, and I love what was quoted. Once your fear of your destination is over, over you can start living each moment beyond your recognition because you don't have this dread. Absolutely. It's settled. Now, what is a Puerto Rican funeral? I, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody said something about a Puerto Rican funeral. I have a feeling that's a joke. I don't know what that is, but... Uh, so there you go, Jeff. It's, it's all tied to the same thing. The Samaritans, they, they had their views on death. Um, so I think if we look in the past, we'll find our answers for the future. Well, at least we'll find some things to think about. That's for sure. So Wow, that was interesting stuff today. Yep, I hope everyone found it was uh, at least a good place to have coffee with. If we could just get the sweet rolls in here. Oh, I can't have any of those sweet rolls anymore. Don't say those words. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Trying to get back into fighting shape. How about the breakfast burrito then? Oh, even that. I can't do any carbs, man. Oh, okay. No carbs. All right. Well, thank you folks for being here. This is amazing. What a great show. Uh, your input really makes uh, the whole show. Thank you for sending me a picture of you in a kilt. Some things can't be unseen, Scotty Roberts. <laughs> but I still appreciate that very much. And ladies and gentlemen, we're here every Sunday morning and also on Wednesday evenings as well for the midweek report. And I want you to, to you know, put these on your schedule. We love having you and yes. we hope to see you again. What do you have going on, Wayne, that you want to tell people about? Well, we're going to continue getting into some of the first. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more into what the spell of Enki could really be and how is there a correlation in other religions. And they're um, kind of basically, I look at this as like the apocalypse, where all the religions have these stories of something ending. Is it the fact that our ancestors did, in fact, send us a message in the bottle? And has that message, that bottle, now risen to the surface and i think that's what we're finding jeff that the message in the bottles risen to the surface yeah i think our our brothers and sisters of the past not the anunnaki i'm talking the samaritans these people that we know existed and <clears throat> okay let's just close out with this real quick jeff think about your place in history and you were asking kind of the beginning i should have thought about this the Samaritans never saw themselves other than what it was. They didn't see themselves as the past because in their minds, they always were the past. And so they didn't primarily write for a place in history. They wrote so that they would have a record. 
and the record was for more of recall. So there you go, Jeff. Interesting. <laughs> I can hear him in the background. People say, Jeff's not listening to you. And I said, he's not supposed to be listening to me. <laughs> shake it off. That's the point. Shake it off. When so, the haters hate, just shake it off. We'll be back on Wednesday. Uh, in, in between, you can find him at R. Wayne Steiger. You can find me right where you are. If you want to come to the event, go to jeffreydarty.com. Lock in your, uh, and I do want to mention this, lock in your place. We did raise the price, but we didn't do it without giving you something. Because when you register now, if you'll send us your full name, your exact date and time of birth, and your place of birth, as soon as you walk into the seminar, you're going to be handled a PDF report of your Vedic astrology from Heidi Vandenberg. Wow. And I'm going to give you a breakdown of your basic numerology. So sign up. Wow. Uh, we have to limit it to 100. They're going to go quickly. But act now. <laughs> yeah. There's hey, still an opportunity. That alone may, from Heidi. It still come down. I'm going to see what we can do. We're looking at it. If not, uh, we really do need to do a live program. I still say run it on YouTube or Facebook. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, for our Wayne Steiger, I'm Jeffrey Darty, and we appreciate you. Uh, we salute you, and we will see you next time. Thanks for being with us on Not Your Normal Sunday Show. Bye-bye, folks.